Welcome back to the Balancing Act podcast. I'm Andy Tempty. On the Balancing Act, we talk to business leaders and industry experts to explore the balancing acts we play in our professional lives and learn about the events that put rocket boosters behind their career success. Today, we have Paul Barnhurst joining us. Paul is the founder of FP&A Guy, which stands for Financial Planning and Analysis. Uh, he's hosts. He's the host of the podcasts FP&A Today and the new Financial Modelers Corner. He's held financial planning and analysis leadership roles at companies like American Express and Solera Incorporated. As you might expect, we'll be focusing our attention today on the world of financial planning and analysis and the intersection between this critical role and the rest of the business. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hey, thanks for having me, Andy. I'm really excited to be here. Appreciate you inviting me to be on your show. Yeah, thank, thank you. And uh, just FYI, before we get started, uh, the Financial Modeling Institute, which I'm a board member of, uh, is uh, going to be uh, supporting uh, Paul's new show, Financial Modelers Corner. So I'm really excited about the launch of, the, of that new show. And uh, please, listeners, uh, uh, subscribe to uh, Paul's uh, Financial Modelers Corner. But before we get started, it would be great if you told our listeners your story, and as you're weaving your way through there, if you could define the role of financial planning and analysis, that would be great. Yeah, I'd love to give my story. So you know, when, when I went to school, I had no idea what FP&A was, nor was it something I ever thought I wanted to do, and started my career working for the government my first few years. Pretty quickly realized the government red tape of writing contracts was not for me, went back to grad school. And as I got into grad school, I loved my finance class, ended up switching to do a finance specialization, did an MBA and a master of science in information management, graduated in 2008. And originally I was thinking I wanted to do investment banking, but as you can imagine, the market at that time was not uh, what I'd call stellar by any means, especially for investment banking. And so it took me a little while to find the right job. And I got an opportunity to work at American Express. I originally came in, title was financial analyst, doing a lot of report writing, uh, SQL, dealt with some databases, and it was really beneficial. Helped me learn the business really well, learn a lot of things about data. And then an opportunity came open to get promoted, and I said okay. And it happened to be FP&A. Now I'd done a little bit of forecasting before, but that's really how I learned about FP&A was getting in the role. And so FP&A, I think about there's a few kind of key pillars to it. You know, first, the one everybody thinks about budgeting and forecasting. You're helping a corporate business do its planning, just like an individual planner out there. Somebody who does a financial planner helps an individual plan. You know, then beyond that, you're doing analysis. That's a huge part. You're helping the business make good decisions with its money. You know, really, you're forward looking and your accounting is the backward looking team, right? You have to have all those statements from accounting to go forward. So I spent eight years at American Express, worked in a couple different businesses, business travel, supported travelers checks. From there, I went to an automotive company that was a SaaS-based company called Solera, was there about five years, got promoted a few times, and then went to another company briefly, and then started my own business. And that's where I'm at today. I do training, you know, podcasts, as you mentioned, influence marketing, some research, and a little bit of consulting here and there. That's awesome. Um, if you had to pick one event in your life that just put rocket boosters behind your career. What is that? Yeah, that that is a great question. I would say probably the biggest thing was my move to Solera. It was a company where there was a lot of opportunity to move up and shine, where in American Express, there are a couple challenges. One, I was remote. Not, I, yeah, I was remote a lot of time. I wasn't in headquarters. So it was really hard to move up. Whereas in Solera, there was a lot of changes going on constantly, a lot of acquisitions. And so I really got the opportunity to develop my leadership skills, get those opportunities to work with CFO, work with the regional CFO, with general managers, with the senior leaders. And in addition to that, I think the other thing where I you know, really learned a lot there is it was a company that relied extremely heavily on finance we were really looked at as critical to helping run the business. And so I was involved in everything, always had a seat at the table. As we like to say, a lot of finance people don't feel like they have that seat at the table. 
So I was able to be critical in making business decisions and make a real impact there. So I think you know, that decision to go there really helped advance and launch my career to where I'm at today. If I added one other thing, it was posting on LinkedIn. That's really what's created my biz- business. Right, right. Well, that's uh, wonderful. You know, uh, you have a broad range of experiences in the function of fp a as you've described. Uh, why is this function so important to businesses around the world? Why should, be, why should people be paying attention to this conversation right now? So what I love is, you know, I've heard a few CEOs say, and a friend of mine told me a CEO of a you know, billion-dollar company that came through fp a CFO to CEO. He goes, you know, my fp a team outside of me and maybe a couple other people is the only one that has a holistic view of the company. Right? You get to see all the departments. And what adds to that is you're the only one that sees them through a financial lens, and you're also looking at the operational. So you're in that perfect position to speak up, to make a difference, to see things that others aren't going to see. You know, you talk to sales, and sales things often sees everything through revenue, right? And they're focused on whatever their sales commission plan tells them to be focused on. And, you know, you go over to product, and it's all about, well, I want to spend all this money because we've got to make the product better. But finance is one of those only organizations can look at all those things and say, well, here's how that impacts the bottom line. Here's how that ensures we're creating value so we can continue to employ people and being a going concern going better. So I think fp a is huge, especially nowadays with COVID. All that uncertainty, right? Scenario planning, constantly being a help to business with cash flow, working closely with treasury if you have a treasury department. If you're a smaller company and you have one fp a person, odds are they're also doing treasury, right? Just kind of depends on the company size. But I think those are some of the reasons. Yeah. I uh, I also like to think of fp a as uh, the enabler of great storytelling, uh, just just like mm-hmm. uh, fin- financial modeling, which we'll talk about uh, later, and storytelling is one of the key skills uh, in a in a business. If you don't have a strong FP and A team, uh, you're you're and you don't have strong financial models, uh, the story you're telling is is going to be weaker almost by definition. So, I agree. Yeah, if you had to choose the most important balancing act that the leader of an fp a team has to play, what is that? Yeah. So I think, you know, finance people by nature tend to be more detailed. We like to get into the weeds yeah. and we're often expected to like pull all the data from the whole company and understand it and tell me, you know, why are margins lower for you know, these, these industries? And then you're like, well, the data is not clean, but that's another story. But I, I, I think the real balancing act, the challenge is managing up the leadership's expectations while still trying to understand detail enough that you really know what's going on because you really need to intimately know the business. And it's a real challenge sometimes when you're asked to do a lot of strategic and at a high level, then go do analysis and get deep. And what's the right balance and how do you manage it? I think that's one. There's one other I'll, I'll add, depending on the company, is managing the balance between often you report to the CFO or somebody in finance, but you support a general manager who you often spend much more time with. You're in all their team meetings and things like that. And sometimes, you know, their goals are different. They don't align. And trying to manage that balance and make sure you keep your general manager healthy, you know, happy while focusing on the CFO and the team that you're part of can be a balancing act. I see you shaking your head. I think you could probably relate to that one. Yeah, you, you've got like feet in all <laughs> sorts of uh, different parts of the business and being able to navigate seamlessly in and out of uh, those subcultures really that mm-hmm. exist uh, across the business. Uh, I, I think that uh, that that's key. And later on in the show, we're going to talk more about uh, learning and business acumen. So we'll 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 stick a little pin in that one. But let's go back to you, uh, you personally, and narrow the scope of that previous question. What's the most important balancing act that you've played that has uh, contributed to your career success? Yeah, I would say the the hardest balancing act for me was finding the balance between detail and higher level. And I'll share two examples for me personally. And that's why I talked to that. 
So the first one, I was in a role, I had a director that was super detailed. And I'm a detailed person by nature. So it worked, we did really well. He was let go, I reported on somebody else. And I, you know, I could tell through the grapevine, she didn't like me, she was big picture and thought I was too detailed. And so I had another you know, friend, one of the other guys as a director. And on every call, when I'd get too detailed, he'd send me a note. He's like, bring it back up, stay high level, you know, to help me find that right balance. And then moved to a new company. I had a general manager one day that he looked at me and he goes, Paul, and this principle has really stuck with me. He goes, bluff, bottom line up front. Then you can give me the details. And he was kind of like, I won't read them, but then you can provide the details. Like, just get to the story. I don't need to know the backstory. Mm -hmm. Hmm. and so i think that for me learning that really understanding that balance was critical for my career yeah it sounds like you've uh you've got it figured out and i would say that that balancing act is where many financial professionals get stuck they just can't move from the debt detail orientation, which, uh, you know, is just beat into you in, in, in a collegiate setting, you know, when, when you're mm-hmm. going through your training and, and that big picture perspective. So th- thank you for that. We're going to take a really short commercial break and we'll be right back. I'm Andrew Tempty. The alignment of personal purpose with that of the business we lend our talents to is essential to achieving optimal work-life balance. But do you know what your personal purpose is? To help answer this crucial question, I've created a guidebook to help define your personal purpose and a vision statement to serve as your North Star. Visit andrewtempty.com purpose to download your free copy today. And we're back with Paul Barnhurst talking about the mission critical role of financial planning and analysis. Paul, on this show, we talk a lot about lifelong learning. Uh, can you help us understand how an FP&A professional can help build financial acumen in the non-financial personnel across the organization? You know, we were talking before about business acumen and how an FP&A professional has to know everything around the business. but how can an FP&A professional become a teacher of others? Yeah, I think it's critical to become a teacher and storyteller. The first thing is you really have to understand finance. One of my favorite quotes is, simple is hard, complex is easy. Yeah. It's easy to give a complex, well, this is the balance sheet, and these are the a- assets, and we grew by this, and these ratios, and they're just looking at you like, okay, you're speaking Greek. And you throw out debits and credits and accruals and their eyes are just glazed over. So the first thing you have to do is you have to understand it well enough that you can explain it. Like I love, right, there's a Reddit forum called explain it to me like I'm five. You know, and I I love that idea. And one of the best examples I've heard of that, and I'm actually having him on my podcast here, is I had an episode with a guy by the name of David Brown out of Nigeria. He runs a consulting firm and he talks about how he teaches to non-finance people, the balance sheet without using a single ratio. And so he, he basically says, okay, you have two things. You have assets on this side, he draws a picture, and you have liabilities and equity. Liabilities would be debt, like if you buy a home, and credit. And then he starts breaking them down and he starts moving them and says, okay, what would, ha- what would cause this to move? Like he explains, okay, if working capital, this part's working capital here. And this just doubled. Why would that double? And people start thinking of reasons. And he moves the, okay, we raise stock or, you know, and just moves it around from the five categories he breaks it out into. And after like 20 minutes of doing that, he goes, now you understand ratios. Now I'm going to bring a number into the equation. And they're no longer scary. So I think trying to think that way, that just shows the power of how visuals can make a difference. Because often as finance people, we like to see all the numbers and the detail. But our partners typically just want to see the big picture and want you to explain what's important, what matters to them. I think the other key in really that storytelling is always make sure you take it from the perspective of what's in it for them. So W-I-F-T instead of what's in it for me is really think what's in it for them. Yeah, I I learned that lesson uh, very early in my life, actually, in a mathematical logic uh, class that whole uh, concept that simple is hard and complex is easy. You had to write, we had to write proofs 
uh, and the the most elegant, simple uh, proofs, the answers were really, really hard, uh, <laughs> really hard to get to. I could write a proof that was 19 lines long <laughs> and I would invariably get back, okay, you got the right, you got to the answer, but uh, so elegance, parsimony, uh, th those are really uh, great lessons for folks. Uh, we also frequently discuss the balancing act that we have to play between the application of technical skill and human skill in the world of work. And I think FP&A mm -hmm. is right at the intersection here. Let's do a little thought experiment. You have a college graduate with designs to get into FP&A sitting right in front of you right now. What advice do you give them to balance human and technical skill as they begin their career? So one of the first things I would tell them, and this is something the dean of our MBA school told us, he goes, technical skills are going to get your first job out of school. The human skills, soft skills, whatever you want to call them, are going to get you promoted. And so that's, I think, one thing I'd offer them. And then I'd talk a little bit more about what I mean about that. Make sure you're technically proficient. You can do the things in Excel, build the model. Today, understand how you can be more productive with AI. You know, do BI. But then spend your time, and particularly the human skills, developing those superpowers. Right. And communication is important, storytelling. And first figure out which ones you're really good at. Maximize that. Figure out those that you made def deficient where it's going to hurt you and bring them, bring them up enough that you're competitive with others. You don't have to be a superstar in every area. I mean, just about nobody is. If you are, then you're going to, you should move up quickly. But, you know, really focus on that. So I remind them it's about relationships. It's about people. It's about communicating. You know, often in finance, we spend 90% of the time on the analytics and 10% on the last mile. And that's what gets us in trouble because the last mile, those parts of putting the presentation together, thinking about the narrative, that's a what, a what allows us to influence the business. And if you're not influencing the business, you're not going to get promoted. Right. Yeah, this uh, we 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 all we always think that uh, all the relationship management skills sit in the sales department, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> nothing really could be further from the truth because FP&A financial modeling, uh, you know, you sit at the intersection of all parts of the business, and if you're not mm -hmm. building those relationships. Uh, you're not going to get all the information you need when you need it. You're going to get kind of a half-assed uh, uh, dis uh, discussion of this or that, and your models are going to suffer because of it. Uh, so the, the, the technical outputs almost rely on those, uh, th those human skill uh, inputs. Uh, so, Yeah, and, and I'll have a, just a little story I have to share there yeah. that I think really hits us home. I was talking to a guy. We spoke last year at AFP on building trust. And one of the guys I was talking to, he goes, he had this team. He had a lot of really good technical people. people, And then he had one guy that he's like, I don't know that he did anything. He was really good at drinking coffee. He's like, I don't know if he's good at anything. He goes, he was really good at drinking coffee. But then he made a point. He goes, see, there's one other thing. He goes, no, there's one other thing he's really good at. He'd go talk to everybody in the business. And he would always come back and find out something we didn't know about so we could prepare. He was great at that. He's like, I couldn't have him do anything else, which is obviously you don't want. But it, he talked about how much value that added to the team because that guy had relationships with everybody and could just bring back information they weren't getting. Right. And I thought it was really interesting is because he had great human skills. Yeah. Yeah. So, Paul, another thought experiment. Uh, you have access to a time machine that uh, you can send about 280 characters uh, to an earlier version of you. Uh, what is that message and what previous version of yourself do you choose to send it to? Ooh, that is a great question. Let's see. What am I going to go with there? So if I could send a message back to myself, well, I would, I would send a note saying, let's see, send it back to my junior high self and say, take that money you have and invest in Apple, <laughs> Microsoft, <laughs> and a couple other companies. That's the easy <laughs> answer. <laughs> On a more serious note, you know, one, I would tell myself to to focus on, on health. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is holistic, the mental, everything. I'm very much where I can get tunnel vision. And if there's a lot to do, I start letting other things slip. 
And, you know, I've had to learn over time, no, you have to take care of yourself. You got to think about eating. You got to think about exercising and, and those type of things. So if I give one message to myself, it's make sure you stay focused on what's really important. And that's rarely work at the end of the day. I love that answer. Thank you so much, Paul. Now, final question to wrap up the show. Tell us more about what you're doing at uh, FPNA Guy. What's next for you personally? And spend a little bit of time on uh, your new show, Financial Modelers Corner. Yeah, I'd love to. So, you know, I think of the business, there's a few different areas. Consulting and, you know, last year that was probably half of what I did. This year it's less than 5%. Wow. I have one gig and I've been so busy on other stuff. I I'm waiting for my friend to fire me. <laughs> yeah, I say that joke eagerly, but he's a he's the CFO. We've worked together before. And so I've done quite a bit of corporate training. We we're just at Dollar General this week, their headquarters, and did business partnering, storytelling, visualization, talked about those things with them for a day. I have two digital courses, one out and one getting ready to launch that I've finished, one on design principles for modeling. And the second is driving value through smart analysis. So I have that. I have a cohort course, best practice FPNA. So, you know, I do quite a bit of training. And then in addition to the training, I have the two podcasts. So FPNA today, we've been out, I think episode 61 came out this week. You know, and we're doing really well. Our numbers keep growing. So that's been really fun. And then you know, super excited. We'll talk a little bit about the second one, Financial Modelers Corner. You know, a few months ago, I was like, I love this podcast thing. It'd be fun to do a second one. And I was trying to think, you know, who could I partner with? How could I do it? You know, I didn't want to work with another, uh, I didn't want to work obviously with a competitor of my first sponsor. And I was like, financial modeling would be fun. And I thought of a few sponsors and I had talked to in a few months back, had him on the show. And I was like, it'd be great to talk about financial modeling. I think that's a really an area that people really struggle because we don't teach how to model. We teach finance. We teach how to balance a balance sheet. You know, I don't remember getting any advice in any of my finance classes, undergrad or grad, of how to design a model, how to think about it. We've got better, but we just have so far to go on that front. So I really wanted to bring that to the forefront and partner with an organization. And you understand this financial modeling institute that really is saying, look, it is it's its own craft and people should be accredited. There should be qualified modelers. We shouldn't just trust anyone to build this big, huge model because we think they're good in Excel or we think they're good at finance. And so that there's that, the financial modelers corner of the podcast. And then the last area, I'll, I'll bucket it under influence marketing, but there's a few things within that. I'll do webinars with vendors from time to time, you know, educational sponsored content, and then also guides. I wrote last year, a third generation market guide highlighting 15 new planning tools in the marketplace. I've had demos of over 60 software. I've talked to probably 80 of the vendors out there. I have 140 plus on my list. I've talked to, you know, probably more like 100 of them. And so we're getting ready to do that guide again this year. So I'll do some research in that area. And then I've done a few conferences like demo day type events where we bring some of these best tools together and allow companies to see them in an environment where they don't have to sit through a sales presentation yeah. and all the pressure of five, six different companies. They can come for a day, see them all, and then decide, oh, I want to look at these two. I'll go talk to them now. Wow. The value add of uh, that that guide that you're putting together of all the tools that are out there for <laughs> for financial professionals, it, it's just dizzying. And then you get into a sales pitch and you don't know what's true and what's not. So <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're going to really add value uh, to the business community generally uh, with with just that. So I'm really proud that uh, to have you on the show to uh, introduce you to to our audience, the value of financial planning financial modeling. I look forward to uh, speaking with you again in the future. Uh, my name is Andy Tempty. This is the Balancing Act podcast. You've been on with Paul Barnhurst, the FBNA guy today. Uh, we're on all the major streaming services. Please like, subscribe, rate, and share. We're creating a public good here, and we want you to keep learning and growing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. It was a real pleasure to be here and to talk to your audience.